So you could also try to, you know, talk to your employer if you're, if you're going to stay at your current job, see if you could set like, like a six to 12 month plan right now where you say, okay, I'm going to set these goals of X, Y, Z. If I can achieve these goals in the next six months or 12 months or whatever it is, can we have a conversation at that time and sit back down and discuss my compensation? They're going to appreciate the initiative that you're taking to go and increase your value to the company. And then if you're able to meet those targets, they have no reason not to offer you a, a higher salary. And if you, uh, if you're, if they don't offer you a higher salary after that time, you can put that on your resume and say, I achieved X, Y, Z, and then look elsewhere. Welcome to the first interview episode of Greater Than Enough. In this episode, we're going to talk to Daniel Braun, a YouTuber and personal finance expert. We're going to talk about all things money from quitting your day job and going all in on YouTube to budgeting, relationships and money, credit cards, and more. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Dan, so thanks for being on the first episode of the Greater Than Enough podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. So I think you've mentioned in a couple of your YouTube videos how a couple of years ago you graduated from college, started a full-time job, and then part-time launched your YouTube channel. And I think it was just early this year you quit that job and are now just full-time focused on YouTube. Can you just walk me through that journey of deciding to start a YouTube channel? What was the decision process as far as you know quitting your full-time job and going all in on you know your content for YouTube? I mean, it was... Uh... Definitely a long journey. I, I so I graduated from Penn State back in 2018, uh, majored in finance. So I always had uh, a great deal of interest in anything money related, business related. Uh, but I always thought of myself just going the, the traditional path out of college, getting a corporate job, um, finding something that at least interested me somewhat. So that was kind of what I did out of school. I got a job working for an insurance company. Uh, it was kind of like a little subset. Um, smaller team within this insurance company that I worked for in Philadelphia. So, um, yeah, worked with them for a couple of years, I guess, long-term, I didn't really see it as being what I wanted to do with my entire career. So I was always kind of actively looking to see if there was anything that maybe would fit me a little bit better. I came across one company, um, interviewed, got a job offer in early 2021. So I accepted that. Uh, and it was right around that time that I actually started the YouTube channel at the same time, kind of as, sort of a side project because I knew that I wanted to at least have some sort of a side hustle and maybe eventually turn it into some sort of additional uh, income stream because I saw a lot of people doing that throughout the pandemic, kind of making a lot of content around personal finance, credit cards, money, all that type of stuff. Uh, and then they started sharing about like how much money they were making from that thing. And I thought it was really interesting. I was already watching their content. I was already like heavily invested in the stuff myself. So I at least wanted to join the conversation make it a side hustle that I could do in my free time on the weekends. And I guess after five or six o'clock at night, I would kind of script out videos, get video ideas, film, edit. Um, so yeah, I started this new job back in January, 2021 or March of 2021, but I started this YouTube channel back in January. Turns out, I guess I, I kind of disliked the second job more than my first job. Um, but I was kind of going along with it, just seeing where it went. But at the same time, really was so focused on YouTube. I was just, that was all I could think about day and night. Um, so I would, you know, post at least one video a week, if I could, two videos a week throughout 2021. And then eventually towards the end of last year in December, 2021, I really just, just was at a point in my career with that first or that, that second job that I. I wasn't seeing it going anywhere. And I had this sort of big opportunity cost was the way I looked at it, where I have my YouTube channel. It was only around 3,300 subscribers at the time that I quit my job, which was definitely uh, taking that leap a little bit too early, I'd say. But at the same time, it was starting to make some good income and I could see where it was growing to. I knew over the next few months where I expected it to be. So in my head, I kind of thought, all right, I know what I'm making with my salary at this job. and uh, if I could just get this YouTube income to be even half of that and then eventually grow it up to being maybe maybe a few thousand dollars a month, um, it could replace my full-time income. It would just take a little bit of time and see where the YouTube channel went. At the same time, I, you know, it was a strong job market, so I could always find another job was what I told myself. But I absolutely loved working for myself, setting my own schedule, growing the YouTube channel, growing an audience, interacting with people, uh, just all of it, the whole content creation process. So. Uh, this whole past year, I've grown it from, I think I started the year with around 5,000 subscribers. And now today, as of filming this, I think I have like 52, 53,000. So yeah, I definitely think it, it paid off a little bit this year. We'll see how long it continues. But yeah, I mean, I love getting to make content around credit cards, personal finance, just everyday money type of stuff. Uh, I love it. 
No, that that's amazing. I think one of the things um, that I want to dig into, there's a couple of things here. The first is around, you know, one graduating from college and kind of taking a job, any job kind of related to, you know, your major. But then I think over time, obviously you realize the things that you like, you don't like, sometimes there's some false starts or starting the second job. You're like, you know, maybe I kind of read things wrong or, or, or misunderstood some of the things I really liked about my previous job that this one didn't have. And then kind of going all in on YouTube and realizing, you know, the benefits of that and how much you like to work and some of the stuff you talk about kind of what advice do you have to go through that journey, regardless of if it's YouTube related or, you know, finding that next job that kind of gets rid of some of the things that you don't like and has more of the things that you do like. Mm -hmm. A common theme for a lot of things that, uh, that I'll probably say in this podcast is to think long term. Uh, you know, it's easy to, kind of get lost in whatever you're doing at the moment. Like I, um, and I think a lot of people kind of go down that path. Like you, you go to college, you major in something, hopefully you find a major that interests you. I was lucky enough to find finance. I, I think I went in just for a general business type of major and eventually, um, landed on finance. I figured it was, it was useful, had a lot of applications later on. And at, at the very least, it was going to give me a better understanding of how businesses function and how to manage your own money. And, um, you know, I, I learned enough from that major, but I'd say I learned a lot more at that first job. Um, so that was another real benefit of working in the corporate world for that time was, uh, I'd say a lot of my ability to like read financial statements all came from my first job out of school and not from college. So it's kind of the whole concept of like, you're paying to go to college, but you're learning. And then when you go into your first job, they're paying you, but you're also learning at the same time. So there was a lot of value in that for me. I didn't take any of that for granted. Um, then the second job came up and I thought it was going to be something that interested me. I felt like it was, it was going to be something more in the, in the healthcare industry. And I, I think my, throughout my whole career up to this point, I've really chased, um, having more of an impact. I remember very specifically like interviewing with this company and saying, listen, uh, one word that keeps coming back to me is the word impact. Like I want to have an impact on people in some way, shape or form. And I felt like this job was going to have more of that. Um, when it came down to it and I got into the job, it really was just a lot of Excel work and it wasn't, it wasn't exciting to me. So I had this side project to occupy my time. Um, and then, yeah, it was just, uh, kind of a combination of things when the time felt right for me to make the leap to YouTube full time. Um, it was really more so me not feeling like that job was the right fit. And then I had this other opportunity. It was kind of a combination of those two things at the same time. It wasn't so much like, I hated my job that I had to quit where it wasn't so much like I saw YouTube as this big opportunity, but it was like a combination of those two things that really pushed me over to the edge to just at least give it a shot. Like, um, I, I was probably 20, uh, 25. I think I just turned 26 at the time that I quit my job. So I'm young. I, I have the time to go and get another job if I need to, I could take risks right now. I don't have a family or, you know, very many expenses. So I, I think I was in a fortunate position in that kind of way that I felt comfortable making that leap. But looking back, you know, maybe it wasn't the, the perfect time to jump, but I'm, I'm definitely glad that I did. No, I think that's really good. I think a couple of things that I thought about, so I studied finance and undergrad too. One, there are certain things that sometimes you kind of pull back or you think about five, 10, 20 years later. So for example, I was a teaching assistant for the intro to finance class that every business major had to take. And it was just finding a different way to get through, depending on how someone thought. Um, I thought just to be really interesting, but it, it didn't really kind of come back to, you know, where I am now of thinking about, you know, my, the enjoyment I got from teaching and coming up with different ways to explain concepts so that someone would understand it and take it to heart and, and to be able to, in that case, do well on exam and, and now to talk about things more personal finance related. And then I think with, with jobs, I think a lot of times, some of the things that I had thought about were you know, does this job, uh, open up more doors for me? So sometimes it may not be something that you see of like, I want to do this for my entire life, but it, it gives you options. It looks good on your resume. You know, for example, getting into the MBA program I got into or things like that of, you know, doing the right things to be able to do that. And then also, I think one of the things I always looked at was like, what do I think of my, my boss's job? So it's maybe some of the things of like, if I don't like everything I'm doing now, but if I were here for three, five, 10 years more, what would that job look like? And maybe it's worth to kind of struggle through some of the things that over time are going to get better where you're there. And then, you know, I think there's never a, a perfect time to, you know, go full time on a business. Obviously, if you're like, you know, keep waiting and waiting, you know, much longer, like you were just explaining of, 
you know, maybe a lot more people decide to start personal finance YouTube channels and, and the opportunity isn't there as much. And so, you know, I think we'll talk about this more later of, you know, managing your money well, having an emergency fund where that, you know, Hey, I have some time that I can dedicate to this. If it doesn't work out, I have this finance skill set. I'm learning about marketing, building an audience, YouTube, creating video. So it's like, I'm building my skill sets. Plus there's this huge opportunity in front of me and maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't, but you know, mm-hmm. there, yeah. there's, there's no time like today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just going back to what you said, like that was looking at like the people ahead of you in the company was something that I very much did. I would, I would, in both the two jobs that I had after college, the first job, it was much more of a smaller, it was, it was a big company I worked for, but it was a smaller team inside that company. Um, the, the, this smaller, it was called surety. If anybody's a finance major, look up surety. Uh, it's actually a pretty enjoyable career path. I'd never heard of it before, but you get to golf a lot, you get to go out and network with people. Um, definitely worth it. Um, so anyway, I, w- I would look at that, that kind of career path and it was very like, you could see the top and it was, it was very like direct and you actually had access to like, I, I, I could talk to and, and would go on business meetings with like, like the, the, the chief guy at the top, the president, the, the chief underwriting officer that I was, that was on our team. Like, and that was pretty cool to get access to that, to that kind of level of, of experience. You could see that path, but then, um, and, and the other company, it was, it was such a, uh, mixed up corporate hierarchy that was just so wide. And it was, it was really like, it felt unclear to me. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It was, it was something that I couldn't even see my boss's boss. I have no idea what his role was. Like my, I, I, I couldn't see any clear path in a company where I was like, yes, I want to do that. And the other company I could see it. If, if, if I felt like it was like really what I wanted to do, I felt like they were going to give us the resources to be able to advance up there. And then the pay was going to be very good. So for that type of career path, um, I think having like a smaller company that you're working for is maybe the way to go. But at the same time, and you know, if you work for a big company, you get a lot of good resources too. So there's some trade-offs as to like, what's the best option, but, um, yeah, either way it was good experience. Yeah. I think one of, one of the things let's transition a little bit to, um, your experience with YouTube. Cause I think there's a lot of people that are probably in that boat where they're, they have a job, they have a paycheck, maybe it's not what they're the most passionate about. And so why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, the decision to start on YouTube, what recommendations you have for somebody that is thinking about going down that path? Yeah. I mean, I love talking about this stuff. Just, um, beginning on YouTube is such an unknown thing for so many people. So when I was getting started, I really would watch these videos. I kind of prepared for maybe a week or two, just like looking around YouTube, looking at different niches, seeing like what interested me the most. And of course it was, it was anything related to finance. It was watching guys like Graham Stephan and, and, you know, you would just see their path. I would go back and look at their early videos and see kind of what they were doing, how they've progressed over the years. I would see kind of what's working. So I'd say that I spent maybe just like a week or two preparing, thinking about like, okay, what's a general path that I could go down if I'm going to start making videos. But when it came down to it, it was really just a matter of like, it sounds so cliche to say it, but just taking action and starting. And again, going back to what I said before, thinking long term. So I told myself from the very beginning, like, I'm going to stick with this for the first hundred videos and I'm not just going to upload five videos per week and, and get to those hundred videos very, very quickly. Like I'm going to do as much as I can on top of my current job, which ended up being about one video per week, sometimes twice per week. Um, but I told myself, I'm going to stick with this for 100 videos. I'm going to try to get better with each one. I know that they're going to be terrible at first, but nobody's going to find these videos. I think a lot of people hesitate starting on YouTube right away. And I did at first kind of. Um, because you don't want people to like find your videos and and laugh at you or, uh, you know, friends make fun of you, family makes fun of you or anything like that. So I, uh, I just figured, you know, if my videos are doing good enough that anybody's going to find me on YouTube, then obviously I'm doing something right. Otherwise they're just going to be throwaway videos. Nobody's going to see them. You'll get maybe like 10 or 20 views, but you're going to learn from them and you're going to get better. So I took that kind of mindset. I committed to doing a hundred videos and to be honest, I think I just passed a hundred total uploads. I think if you go on my channel right now, it's probably just under a hundred because I've removed some of my like very first videos that are just absolutely terrible. But, um, funny enough, my fourth ever video caught on and, um, it was an Amex platinum unboxing video and that started to get a bunch of views. And that was what told me, Hey, there's like something here in the credit card niche. And that's sort of like a sub niche of personal finance that I'm interested in. So let me roll with that. So I, I think I would have never found that if I hadn't just gotten started and, um, 
just saw what was working. You just, you just have to test out different things. So, you know, if you're starting out in personal finance, for example, like maybe you have an interest in real estate, you could talk about different things in real estate. You could talk about different things in credit cards, but you want to try to find things that are very searchable at first. Uh, my very first video, I think was something along the lines of like five mistakes I've made with money at 25 years old, but like nobody knows who I am. I'm just some random 25 year old making a YouTube video talking to a camera. Like it's, there's nothing searchable. Nobody's gonna discover that. YouTube's not gonna push that out to anybody. But if I'm making a video, unboxing the Amex Platinum card and talking about its benefits, that's got a better chance of showing up in YouTube search. So I got lucky enough that something about the video um, allowed it to rank in YouTube search and that brought in some viewers from that and then kind of got the ball rolling. So I went with it, stuck with the credit card stuff. And now slowly, like as I keep growing the channel, I wanna you know, try experimenting with other things that are in similar areas of interest. So you know, people watch credit card content, they probably like to save money on travel. If you like to save money on travel, you probably like to save money elsewhere. If you like to save money elsewhere, maybe you're budgeting or you're trying to budget or just these different overlapping areas of interest, you kind of pick it up as you go, but you have to be willing to experiment with different things get 1% better with each video. Um, but yeah, if you're a beginner, just commit to doing, I'd say 100 videos. It might take you a year or two to hit that, but if you can commit to that to the long term, it's going to pay off. Like you, you're going to get better. It's you just, you're not gonna make 100 of the same videos, or I hope that you're not making 100 of the same videos, um, cause that's no, no no progress. Yeah, I think I think following up on that, so there was there's a YouTuber, Roberto Blake, who has a video, make 100 crappy videos. And so that, that was yeah. kind of a, the, the same idea where if you, I think they took this out of YouTube recently where you could sort by a YouTuber's oldest videos. And so I would just mm -hmm. tell people to do that, of like see the first videos of your favorite YouTuber and, and see what it looked like. And mm -hmm. you're going to see that there's this huge progression of, you know, the first videos I recorded with my iPhone success. And I had these, these cheap paper lantern lights that I had hung up in front of me. So I had to like Jerry rig something to have the two cameras up there, the two lights in front of me. And it's, it's one of those things that just kind of progresses over time, but it's just, it's that fear of, of creating the first one of like, well, if I had the perfect camera or this, that, or the other, and people end up waiting six months, a year, or whatever it is, and, and don't end up creating it. I mean, it's part of the reason we're actually starting a, a course for YouTube beginners to have like live sessions and like walk them through step-by-step step of like any one of your fears, we're going to help you with that. So there's no more excuses. Let's, let's get your first videos created. And, yeah. and then I think it's what you're saying too, with, with really anything of, of obviously you can't just create the same hundred videos of create a couple, go and look at them, what, which ones worked, which ones didn't, what are the things that, you know, you think you can improve on and just, as you said, get 1% better with each one. And then over time, you're like, after hundred videos, you know, there's, there's a pretty good chance if you learn from your previous mistakes or what worked or what didn't that, you know, you'll, you'll find success on, on YouTube. Um, besides YouTube, are there other kind of side hustles that you've thought about? Like, is there something else besides like before you started your YouTube channel, like things that you, you consider doing for extra income. So my, my whole thing was what I, my first, I guess, like venture into any type of like business related activity was in high school where I would, I would, you know, work summer jobs. So I, I caddied at a country club one summer. I worked in like a shipping department somewhere another summer, um, just to make some extra cash. And then I would take that cash and I would invest in sneakers like Air Jordans. So I played basketball in high school. I mean, I love, I love sports. I love basketball, especially. And, um, I would, you know, get interested in all these types of retro air Jordans. So I would go out and, and I would wear these shoes and I would, you know, buy the Jordans and the Kobe's and all these Nike shoes and play basketball in them in high school. But then at the same time, I would get the, you know, the cool looking Jordans, the throwbacks that he wore in the eighties and nineties. Um, I would, I would go on Nike.com every Saturday morning and there'd be some sort of a release that was it, it would be limited. So Nike would do these, these, and they still do it, um, these drawings on their website, or now they use an app. Um, but I would go on every morning at 7am and my parents would look at me like I'm crazy. Like you're, you're 16 or 17 or whatever. You're waking up at 7am on a Saturday to go buy sneakers. Like you're wasting your money. But, but at the same time, I was never buying the sneakers just to like wear them. I would also buy them or buy two pairs. Maybe one I would wear or the other, I would flip and you buy it for maybe $160. I think it would cost back then prices have gone up now, but, um, it would probably be about $160 for a pair of air Jordans. And then you could sell them on the secondary market, like literally the same day, uh, for close to like $300. So, I mean, you could, you could almost double your money. Um, so if you, so if you, bought, so if you bought two pairs of shoes, the other pair yeah. would pay for your pair. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, if you were able to do that, sometimes I'd be able to do that. Sometimes you're you're only limited to one, you know, per Nike.com order, but you could go on Foot Locker or any of these other websites and try to do the same thing. And they'd all have a a raffle for in a pair of Air Jordan 11 sneakers uh, Saturday morning. All these websites, so I would have like three computer monitor screens and just I would I would try to get these shoes and just like click refresh and and add to cart and all that stuff. So, you know, you, it was a little bit of like getting lucky, but like if you put the effort in, you'd have a good shot at getting a pair. So I would do that and um, yeah, I would flip the shoes. And then the cool thing was like these shoes that I would wear, they actually held their value. So I remember actually having like an Excel spreadsheet where I would, I would view it as my portfolio of sneakers. And whether I flipped it, I would then like, okay, I generated a, a 100% profit return on this, on this pair of sneakers. Or if I would wear the pair of shoes, I actually went back and like, this is like so many, I graduated high school probably what, like eight years ago or something like that. Nine years ago, almost. Um, I would wear those shoes. I really didn't wear any like Jordans in college or anything like that. You kind of, I moved on from them, but I would have them sitting in my parents' house for, you know, probably like five, six, seven years. And then I needed some cash and I was like, oh, hey, I got all these shoes laying around. They're kind of worn, but let me just go sell them on eBay. And they held their value. I would literally sell the exact same shoe that I bought for $160 wore 10, 15 times and they're a little dirty and scuffed up and I'd sell them for $160 five years later. Like they held, they held their value. Um, even though they were used, I kept them in good condition and you know, good enough condition. So that, I guess that was like my first real side hustle, but I would, I would do that kind of thing. And even now, I think even over the past few years, I'll still sell a pair of sneakers. If I get a notification and I know there's like a hyped up pair, um, I think I got a pair of Travis Scott Nike shoes last year, two years ago or something like that. I just got a notification. Hey, they went live. Let me go try to buy them. I think I bought them for like 200 and flipped them the same day for like 600. Like it was crazy. So, um, yeah, that was, that was what really got me interested in like any type of business. So it was a nice little like side hustle, uh, over the years, especially in high school and college, just to generate a little bit of extra cash, um, and get me thinking. And then I, I think after that. Um, I remember starting my first job after college and thinking, all right, I need to do something in my free time that I was like, all right, that's, that's pretty cool. Let me see what else I can do. And eventually, uh, you know, 2020 happened. We were all kind of like stuck working from home. I think there was a big like pause of like, all right, what am I doing? What's going on with my career? What's going on with the world right now? So I kind of paused at that time. Um, and then towards the end of 2020 is when I really started to look into YouTube as a side hustle. And then I'm like, you know what, let me give this a shot because I love credit cards and I love YouTube too. Like, I think, I think that's an underrated thing with YouTube is being, um, being like an avid consumer of YouTube videos, which I have been ever since I can remember, like literally, I remember sitting on my very first iPod touch. It was like a first generation iPod touch. It came preloaded with a YouTube app and I would watch videos back in like 2008 or whatever it was, um, on YouTube. So I've, I've been doing that for years. So I think it made a lot of sense that eventually I wanted to give YouTube a try. I just had to get over the fear of like putting myself on camera. No, I think one, one of the things I think is really helpful that you talked about watching, say Graham Stefan or other people on YouTube. And I think he's been really open about it. And I know you've been open about this recently of sharing how you make money through YouTube. And so I think that there's a lot of misconceptions. So I met with a bunch of my friends as I traveled a little bit over the summer and both like little kids want to be YouTubers. And then adults are like, there's something here, but I don't know all the ways you can make money or how could this either help a business that I have or how can I create an entire business around, around YouTube. And so if you can just talk a little bit about the video created on, you know, how much money you're making on YouTube and essentially the different ways that you're making money through your YouTube content. Yeah. So to break down the ways that I'm making money on YouTube right now, there's really three major ones. And then there's a few that maybe I'll add eventually, but right now the three major ones are affiliate marketing, YouTube AdSense, and then sponsorships. So uh, the sponsorship thing is kind of new. I really haven't done too many sponsored videos, but I also realize that there's kind of a lot of potential there because companies just, when when you're getting views on your videos and you're in the finance niche, finance related companies, FinTech companies, brokerage companies, all these uh, brands out there want to get eyeballs on their brand. So they're willing to pay top dollar for that kind of content. So, um, you know, every now and then I'll do a sponsored video for a company that I think in my head, I've kind of predetermined what brands I want to work with. So I'll get a lot of companies that reach out to me, um, you know, 99.9% of them. I just say, Hey, thank you, but not looking for something like this right now. Uh, But then the remaining, 
that point one percent uh you know i'm willing to work with and and will promote uh so that's just sponsorships it's just it's a smaller amount but it's hopefully going to keep growing um affiliate marketing is kind of uh one that i'm really going to try to focus on for next year but it's still is it's it's a good amount of of my current revenue right now where especially in the credit card niche there's you know you're talking about a, a, any type of credit card from any credit card issuer um you know I'll, I'll be a part of a an affiliate network where they'll give me a link and then i can post that link in my video descriptions somebody watches one of my videos on 10 best cashback credit cards they can go to the description and they can click on one of those credit cards and apply through that link so i'll get a little kickback but at the same time i'm providing value i'm telling you what each credit card does i'm not like trying to sway anybody to choose one card over the other you know i'll be very honest on any type of credit card uh, so there may be certain credit cards that pay higher commissions, but at the same time, I'm going to be very critical of like, all right, maybe it pays higher commissions, but th that card probably has an annual fee of 200, 300, 500 dollars, whatever it might be. Um, so I want to lay out, okay, who's this credit card for? And then hopefully the right person finds that video and they're able to sign up. And then every party kind of wins. The credit card company gets a customer, the person gets a credit card that makes sense for them, and I get a little bit of a kickback for providing value and hopefully helping them decide what the best setup for their wallet is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then a third. Yeah. Well, before you get into bigger. the YouTube revenue, I think one of the important things there, so we have this channel that talks about personal finance, also one that's marketing related. And with both of them, we do a lot related to affiliate marketing. And so our Spanish marketing channel is like 300 and some thousand subscribers. And so we get a lot of people reach out as far as sponsorships. And I think there are maybe some channels that would be like, well, whatever sponsorship, whatever thing I can make a good commission on. But really it's about building long-term relationship, building a long-term relationship with your audience. And in general, we would, ex we would accept sponsorships or we promote products that we're already using ourselves. So it's like we use mm -hmm. convert kit for email marketing, let's say. And so like we've been using it for four years now. And so it's really easy to create a tutorial or promote something like that when it's like, this is what we use for our business every single day. So, you know, I, I don't feel bad at all recommending something like that or, or just being really honest of, Hey, here's my favorite things, or here's look out for this, or here's the five reasons that I made this decision versus that you may want to take mm -hmm. it, make a different decision than I did, but, um, just being really honest and building the trust with your audience and, and having them feel and, and deep down how it is of, you know, I'm only going to recommend stuff or I'm, I'm really sharing, you know, my true opinion. I'm not taking sponsorships or trying to make money from affiliates of things that I, I don't believe in, or I wouldn't use myself. Yeah. And there's a couple of things with that. So I get a lot of companies that reach out and there, there's a few companies in particular that have reached out several times and, you know, they offer very generous, uh, sponsorship deals where they'll be like, Hey, you can do this video a few thousand dollars, but it's, it's, I mean, it's not a product that I use and it's a product that maybe it, it's interesting, but if it's not something that I like strictly use or could see myself using, like I, I just, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And I, I think that kind of goes back to the fact that my YouTube channel really is like, it's, it's a personal brand, first of all. So it's my name attached to it. I don't want like any sort of, I don't want anything ever coming back to me and being like, okay, he pushed something that he was lying about it. And he, like, it's it, when you put your name on the line, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of potential reward that could come on if, if I'm doing the right things and, and people can kind of build that trust with me as an audience. But like, at the same time, there's a lot of risk. Like I can easily accept a sponsorship deal that goes wrong or anything like that. So when you're, anytime you're promoting a, a product, whether it's via affiliate marketing or sponsorship, like they, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So I'd, I'm probably overly cautious with it, but I think it, for good reason, like it's, it's, you've seen it happen recently with, with different YouTubers and, you know, different things that maybe they're unseen, but it still can, it can come back and like people blame you because you referred them to a product that maybe wasn't as safe as it could have been. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. And then, and then let's talk about the last area. So you were going to start talking about what the revenue from YouTube. Yeah. So YouTube AdSense is, uh, I guess what everybody's really interested in when they think about, when they think about starting a YouTube channel, um, because you actually get a share of the advertising revenue that your videos generate just by being on YouTube's platform. So, uh, YouTube really stands alone when it comes to, uh, the revenue share agreement, uh, with its creators compared to any other social media platform out there. Um, they give you 55% of the advertising revenue when you're a part of the YouTube program, uh, the YouTube partner program. So you have to get a thousand subscribers first and 4,000 hours of watch time. So, going into starting the YouTube channel, I knew that was the case. You just have to really commit 
again, that's why the long-term commitment to YouTube is a thing because you're not getting paid at all. And I didn't receive a single dollar, a single cent for the first six months. Um, it took six months to get into the YouTube partner program with 4,000 hours of watch time and the thousand subscribers. And that's really just like the beginning. So it's, you, you, you kind of like, I would get into the program. I think my first day I probably made, I think I made $18 and then it like, cause I released a video and then it dropped down to like below 10. And then it's like, okay, well, it's still cool getting to see like some revenue coming in. And it's like another metric that I can use to see my channel growth. Um, but yeah, so they, they, you get a 55, 55% of all the advertising revenue generated by your videos. And the way they track that is, um, by looking at, uh, what companies pay per thousand views to advertise on your videos. So <clears throat> specifically in like the, the personal finance niche on YouTube and talking about credit cards and money and all that stuff, uh, is, is kind of like famous for being one of the higher paying niches on YouTube compared to like a prank channel where, you know, finance right now, the ad rates towards the end of the year here in 2022 companies are kind of dumping, dumping their marketing budget back into, into, um, YouTube ads. So adver advertising rates are up. Um, and I can make anywhere from, I mean, the, the, the top number before any type of split, I think right now could be somewhere above like 30 to $40 is probably like slightly above $40 right now. So that means for every thousand views, myself and YouTube combined are making $40 per thousand views. And then I get 55% of that. So I'm making over $20 per thousand views right now. And then you can start to do the math. If you look at my channel and you see like a video that I just posted gets 10,000 views, you know, you do 10 times 20 and then you're able to get the $200 that you make just, just from that. But then on the other end, like I'm still making, I have all those videos in my backlog, like hundred videos on my channel. So they're all still generating advertising revenue. So that's where if I'm creating evergreen content, which is my, one of my main goals and what I think everybody should do, especially with search-based content is, um, you know, you have this backlog of videos that's still generating all these views. Um, and it kind of just creates this passive income stream a little bit where it's not truly passive because you put in the work ahead of time, but it, it, you know, I could take a two week break from YouTube and I'll still be making a good amount of money per day just off the advertising revenue. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of how it works. But, uh, right now that's probably, I'd say about two thirds of my revenue. So, um, I don't want to be entirely reliant on that as like the only income source from the channel. Cause there could always be another like ad apocalypse where, you know, I guess YouTube pulls ads or companies stop advertising on YouTube or they demonetize my channel for whatever reason they decide that like personal finance has gotten too spammy or something like that. And then they just stop advertising on those types of videos. There's, there's the risk in that. So I, I, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a good like steady stream of income from having a YouTube channel, especially in this niche, but it's also like, I don't want it to be the only, the only thing. Yeah. Do you, do you mind sharing with our audience, uh, what you're currently earning or, or basically a quick summary of the, the video that you did on, on how much you're earning from YouTube right now? Yeah. So right now that in that video from that month, it was just over $11,000 in advertising revenue for that month. And I think in this past month, it was right over 11,000 again. Um, so my views were actually slightly down and cause you get, you get paid on the 21st of the following month for, so like for all my, we're filming this in December for all my November, uh, views, I get paid for my November views on December 21st. Um, so for all my November views, it, it was down slightly, but the advertising rates were up. So I actually made more. So I, I made, I think like $11,100 or something like that from November views for this month. And then throw in some, like, uh, the affiliates and the sponsorship sh sponsorship stuff. Uh, it totaled to around 16,000. Okay. And so how long have you been on YouTube? Just to, to kind of quickly put that together. So around $16,000, mm -hmm. um, in a mm -hmm. month and then, and then how long it took you to get from zero views and subscribers to that point. Yeah. So I, I could give like a brief little timeline of sort of the monetization of my channel. Cause I think it's interesting. And I, I love seeing other channels talking about this stuff type of stuff. Um, so from months zero to six, it was $0 whatsoever. And so, when, so, what, so what was the date of the first video again? Date of the first video was, I believe, January 26th, 2021. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's still under two years old right now. It's, it's, it'll be coming up on that two year mark, which will be pretty cool to reach. Um, but from zero months, zero to six, 
zero dollars whatsoever. I think in month seven, I started to get my first my first little paycheck, which is probably like, I don't know, hundred dollars or hundred eighty dollars or something like that. Uh, I think I got one sign up from a bank account, which was maybe seventy five dollars around there. So to get any sort of money in month seven, month eight, like just making over a hundred dollars, like that was the coolest thing to me because it was just there was no physical product. Like I was, I wasn't selling anything like a sneaker, a pair of sneakers, or or uh, you know a basketball headband or whatever. It was just just like pure media. There was no physical product, so that was that was what was really cool. It didn't fe- it didn't feel like real money because it was just talking about things that I already like would talk about for free. So on YouTube, if you're able to like talk about something that you're truly interested in for free, like that's a good sign of, I think, future success because you, you're, you're truly just making the videos because you enjoy making them. And then the money is just like, it's icing on the cake. Um, uh, so that was really, really cool to be able to get that. And then it slowly started to grow. I think by the time I left my job was December, 2021. So again, like under that one year mark, way too early to leave the job, but it was up to, I think $1,200 by that time. And I remember filming a video and maybe I'll make like a future video about, about doing this. But I remember the day that I left my job, I filmed like a a video in my car that morning and just said like, I I have 3,300 subscribers. Um, I think I just made $1,200 this past month. And my goal is at some point next year in 2022 to get up to $5,000 per month, because that would be like roughly equal to what my salary was at my old job. So it was like, all right, if I, if I could get to that by December, 2022, like that would be awesome. And I'd feel like I accomplished my goal. Um, and then I think it, it took off faster than I thought it would. Once I started to be able to put like my full eight hours to, to, to 10 hours a day into the, the channel, doing it full time as 2022 began. And then, um, I think by like March or April, it was doing over that $5,000. Um, And then sometime over the summertime, it went past $10,000 per month, which was like, that was mind blowing to me, like five figures. Um, And then it's been above that ever since. So it's, it's like, still doesn't feel real. And I I try not to take it for granted any, any day, because it's, I mean, I love what I get to do. And just, it's cool being able to have like excess money now to be able to start reinvesting back into the business and be able to like, find editors and hopefully get some help with that type of stuff and delegate some of these tasks so I can hopefully produce more content or, you know, try to experiment with other different areas of this, this kind of social media business. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's phenomenal. It's a, it's a great story. And I think as, as we're talking about of, of you seeing other YouTubers and the success that they had kind of motivating you, I think sharing your success will help other people decide to, to follow a similar path. Um, so let's talk a little bit about personal finance. So you said earlier that, you know, it's really easy to create content if I would be talking about this stuff anyway. So why, why are your finances or why should people be paying more attention to their personal finances? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's come down to feeling more comfortable. Like I made a video just the other day. It was about budgeting and I, I kind of graduated college, got into my first job, moved into my first apartment. And then I started to slowly like see I was I would I would only track my my um financial well being with uh my bank account balance. So I, I had one uh checking savings account with Wells Fargo and I would um look at that balance and then if it was going up every month, that was a good sign. If it was going down, that was bad. And when I was I kind of graduated college, lived at home for a little bit with my parents, which was uh you know, I was very fortunate to be able to do that, save a little bit on rent, and the bank account balance was going up because my rent expense was zero. But then I moved out and uh, slowly but surely I started to see the bank account balance go down. So that meant to me something was going wrong. Uh, Looked in the numbers a little bit and saw between my two paychecks a month, uh, which was all the income that I had at the time versus all my expenses and now my my rent from my apartment in Philadelphia, um, it was now going down and I I was technically living paycheck to paycheck. So I had to see what was causing that issue. So that's what really led me to start budgeting um, because it was just, it was stress. Like, and that's, it's, you see articles and things in the news about this all the time that it just money is one of the top causes of stress for so many people and so many families. And it's easy for me to like say, I made some changes and I'm saving money here when I, it's just me. Like, I, you know, it's me and my fiance now, but, but for a lot of people that have a family, they have kids, they're, you know, they they need to take care of all these people it's tough. So I I, I know that that's the way a lot of people have to live. And I just didn't want that to be like the way I started my life at age 22, 23. 
Um, so I started to budget. I saw where my spending was going. It was spending way too much on just junk from Amazon and, and whatnot. Um, cut all that stuff out, cut cable, cut just all this random, random subscriptions, random things like that. Um, and really just got my spending under control. I would stop going out to, to eat in the city at lunchtime for work, that kind of stuff. It was, it was just small changes, but it was enough to like limit my expenses to get it so that I was now cash flow positive every month. Um, and then from there I knew that, okay, you, you cut back on your expenses. You can only do that so much. You have to also increase your income. So that was what led me to start looking into the whole drop shipping thing, seeing what businesses I could start. <clears throat> like I said, 2020 happened, which was like a pause. And then I sort of resumed and thought, okay, what could I do next? And that led me to the YouTube channel. So it was really like cutting the expenses, budgeting, seeing what actions I could take today to start working towards either a raise at work, if I was interested in pursuing that, or what side hustles or businesses I could potentially start to increase my cash flow that way. Um, so yeah, really it just comes down to being stress-free, being comfortable. And now that I'm in this position that I'm in now, like it's, it's such an amazing feeling. I feel so lucky, so fortunate to be able to live like that right now. And I don't ever want to let my spending like risk that again. So I don't, I still don't, I, I don't buy anything. Like I'm not, I'm not going to go out and buy another car. Or I, I really don't want to ever move to like a apartment that I don't need or a house that I don't need. That's too big. I, I'm just going to keep my expenses low, build up this, like this, this safety net of savings and investments. And then, um, you know, I can reevaluate from there. But for right now, like I just earn what I can try to reinvest it back into the business. And then, you know, that's just the way I, I want to try to live. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And that's kind of where the name for greater than enough comes from of, I think a lot of people are, are currently kind of less than enough of, you know, either just breaking even or going into debt and just the stress around that. It's not that there needs to be, you know, drive a Lamborghini and have this huge mansion, but it's just like, you know, to be able to choose certain things that you really enjoy doing, not that you can just go out and spend on everything that you could possibly be interested in, but to be able to be like just that, that weight off your shoulders of like, if an emergency happens, I have some money for that. If I want to splurge mm -hmm. on something today, you know, I'm able to do that. If I want to help my kids with college or something that, you know, I'm, I'm putting in money aside for, for those types of things to be like, you know, my life is a lot less stressful if you can kind of take that out. And there's a lot of ways to, as you were saying of, you know, where am I, can I cut my expenses? Um, what are ways to make more money? You know, am I investing well? And, and the combination of all those things kind of making you feel comfortable with, with your finances. And unfortunately it's not something that some people don't talk about it with their friends, with their family, with their significant other. And so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, where do you learn about this? And, and so YouTube is a good way to, to share that knowledge I think is great. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it is like this this subject that people don't like to talk about. Like it's, I remember, I even said to like my parents and and, and people that like, all right, I'm gonna make this video about I'm gonna I'm gonna share my income. Like it's this kind of thing, but like there's like hesitation around it. Like, do you want to do that? Are you sure you want to do that? Do you want people to know how much you like? Are you? But I think transparency, and that's why you're seeing that. I, I, it's I think it's pretty cool that you're seeing some states. I think it was New York that just passed this where you have to like be transparent about the salary that the company's paying you in the job posting, or at least give a range of it. I, th I think there's this greater message of like transparency. And I've seen some cool um, Instagram, TikTok accounts of like people interviewing people on the streets and asking them what their salary is and how they got to that point and advice they'd have. I think it's cool getting that whole transparency. And it, that's, you know, probably one of the positives of this whole social media movement around personal finance um, is that people are willing to talk about it and get it out in the open because you can learn a lot from what other people have been through. Um, and I'm sure there's people that relate to what I've been through, just like I related to some of the things that I saw online and, and I was able to relate to like mistakes that people talk about. And that's what I want to try to make videos about too, like mistakes that I've made along the way and all those kinds of things. It all, it all ties together. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads into my next question. What are some of the largest financial mistakes either that you've made or you see other people making and how to kind of avoid that? There's definitely a few. I mean, I think not being aware of your spending and when I say budgeting, like I, I, I know people really kind of shy away from that term budgeting. It's, it's got a similar meaning to like the word dieting. It's like people, people don't want to go on some fad diet and cut out carbs or do keto or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and I think budgeting is kind of the same way. There's like, there's the envelope system. There's the, uh, the 50, 30, 20 rule, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Like there's all these different rules, but at the end of the day, it's a matter of understanding, okay, what is my income, what are my expenses, 
what's the difference uh, and, and how can I kind of increase the gap between those two things. I just want to be more intentional with my spending. I want to be aware of what I'm spending my money on. So for me, like when I relate it back to dieting, I, I tried doing all that stuff. Like I, I wanted to get in good shape. I had the whole uh, freshman 15 at Penn State, you know, putting on a little extra weight after freshman year and all the dining hall food. So uh, sophomore year, I wanted to get in good shape. So I tried to go to the gym more consistently, but I knew that, you know, eating the right food came along with that. I, uh, I kind of did a similar approach to my, my budgeting where I, I looked at, I downloaded an app and then I looked at my entire weeks, a week's worth of, of eating. So I would track everything that I was eating inside this app to see the protein, carbs, and fat. And I was like, oh, it's probably not that bad. It's, you know, but it was completely out of whack. Like it was just not enough protein, way too much fat, way too much bad saturated fat, all that stuff. So it was kind of eye opening. Okay. Like what you, what you think is going on in your mind with what you're eating along with what you're spending is so much different than the reality. So that's why I think when it comes to budgeting or dieting, it's more of a matter of like just getting it on paper so you can visualize it. And then if you want to stick with it long term, if you're like a nerd like me and you want to track every single dollar, even at this point, like, I'll, you know, I'll do that. But um, I don't do the dieting thing anymore. Like I don't track every calorie I eat because now I, I was able to do that and I got a better sense of what I can eat and I got myself on track and now I know, okay, if I'm eating this, I'm getting what I need um, from the food that I'm eating. So that's kind of the approach that I want people to be able to take. Uh, and it's a common mistake that I see people making is just not knowing what they're spending money on. Um, and budgeting really helps with that. So that's why I made that video. But then another one that I would say, especially for people around their twenties, kind of a, right out of college, um, is kind of like a, it's like, it's like a new pandemic in, uh, in America and sports, sports betting, you know, uh, I see a lot of people really, and you see ads on it all the time on TV is just, is just, you know, special promotions for, you know, placing a bet that it can't lose, but you're only going to win in uh, site credits and you're just going to have to like place more sports bets, all this stuff. It's, it's this never ending cycle. And there's nothing wrong with sports betting. If you want to set aside $50 or a hundred dollars and be like, okay, this is, this is lost money. It's just playing. I'm just going to put it in the account. It's okay to lose. But it's another thing when you just like, you go across, you, you try to do some strategy to, to bet on sports. And it's, it's just, I think it's kind of a, a mess and um, it, it can get people in a lot of trouble. So I think that's something that people don't talk about enough and it's just, it's everywhere nowadays. It was not, you don't see all these commercials five years ago, but now it's every other commercial is, is that kind of thing when you're watching football on Sundays. So it's, it is what it is. It's not a bad thing if you don't make it a bad thing. So just be aware of what you're doing when it comes to that. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's uh, just to follow up on that. I think not just sports betting, I think gambling in general. So if it's, oh yeah. if it's a lottery of like it reached a billion dollars and so like throwing a bunch of money into that, or if there's a casino nearby and it's, it's great of like, I would go, I've been to Vegas a few times with friends and you kind of set aside some money and view that as like entertainment of like, if I lose a hundred bucks today and I get free alcohol, I may have spent that if I went out with my friends anyways. So cool. But then if it's just like, you know, keep taking money out of the ATM because like you're going to win it back and then some. So, I mean, I think mm -hmm. the fact that it's all online now in sports betting just makes it that much more accessible and easier to, to really, you know, take things too far. Yeah. It was one thing when like you had to, you, you would have to fly out to Vegas to do all that. And now it's another thing when you could just, literally just swipe something on your phone and it's it's in two seconds you got you have a hundred dollars bet on something and it's it's very easy to to forget that you have that money in there it doesn't it doesn't feel real it just looks like it's like numbers on a screen so i think that's a dangerous thing for younger people for a, i mean a lot of people any age really but it's it's, it's just something that i i definitely noted noted that in college that it kind of it wasn't as much a thing freshman year but by the time i was a senior it was starting to become legalized and it became more of a thing um, so I always thought that was really interesting, but, uh, outside of that, I think those are two big money mistakes. I think one that I've made is thinking short term and not long term. So what I mean by that is I'll try, I, I tried my hand at the whole, like, not really hardcore day trading, but I was like, okay, I remember downloading Robin hood when it, when it was first released and I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to try like buying this penny stock. That's like five cents right now. And then, and then maybe if it just, if it 10 X is to 50 cents, I'm going to 10 X my money and like just gambling on that type of thing. And it wasn't a lot of money, but at the same time it was gambling. It was spec speculating. So, um, 
really, when you think about it, it was no different than the sports betting. Um, well, I think I think it gets into any, like kind of anything that's kind of get rich quick. So if it's you know yeah. you're going to be a millionaire in the next six months if you do this, mm-hmm. um, you know, generally there's something to kind of watch out for there. And so I think the day trading is one of them. And and so yeah, what happens if you make a couple of lucky or good trades and then you keep upping the amount that you're investing and then you know it doesn't it's not really skill it would just luck at that time and then you know the mm-hmm. luck kind of goes against you and so i think anything if it's yeah some promise of this great wealth in a short amount of time i mean people are seeing that with crypto right now too of you know trying to just not put in the work and and think long term and know that eventually you're going to be able to get there if you if you make the right decisions and then Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it can end up really poor, like the same thing with, with what you're saying with gambling. When you see something that sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Again, another cliche saying, but like when you saw a, a crypto savings account that was promising 8%, 9%, 10% APY versus the, you know, 0.5% at the time a normal bank account savings account had, um, that's going to look more appealing. But they're not pricing in some sort of risk. They're not. They're, they're, there's some sort of risk in there. And then you saw some some so, so-called, I guess, stable coins that were safe bets, savings account with crypto, but and then it, it crashed to zero and you, you lose all your money. So there's always there's always different things to consider when something sounds too good to be true. Yeah, and then I think too, it's like it's okay to to take some risk if it's a small percentage. So, oh, yeah. I mean, you saw obviously it was like Celsius and Voyager and BlockFi and all of the the kind of crypto savings accounts that are basically all have gone bankrupt. And so it's like, yeah, if you put a small percent of your income to be like, hey, it's great they're in a, a higher return than my savings account, but you know, if you're going to put your entire savings in something that just doesn't quite seem to make sense, then then there's a obviously a lot of people out there that, that have lost a lot of money. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting with the, the block thing. I used that, um, just to like, Oh, I'll, I'll go put like a little bit of tiny money into crypto and I would track it on my personal balance sheet, just like I do every week. Um, and I look at the percentages and I had, it was like a couple thousand dollars. That was it. And like, and, and Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it was on the exchange. So that's gone right now. Block is bankrupt, but it was, when I look at my personal balance sheet, my credit card points, I value them on my balance sheet. And that compared to the crypto, it it was like 10 times the amount of the crypto that I had. Like I I had so many more credit card points as a percentage of my like total assets compared to my crypto. So that was it. Like it was money that I was okay losing worst case scenario. And turns out it, they they went bankrupt and I was, I probably shouldn't have had it on the exchange in the first place, but um, it was money that it didn't, financially ruin me because I knew that that's what the purpose of it was. So I think maybe again, being intentional with your asset allocation too, is a good thing. Like if you're going to have a lot of cash on hand, then that's, there's probably re- there should be a reason for that. If you're going to have a lot of money invested in crypto, know the risk that you're taking. Um, just, just, yeah, be very careful with that type of stuff. Yeah, no, totally agree. And so why don't we move on? You've mentioned this a couple times already, but, um, you recently re- released a video on how you budget. It's not at all how I think about it. Um, and so I'll maybe <laughs> share a little bit of that, but, uh, but I'd like to hear kind yeah. of your thoughts of, of how you manage your money within Excel. Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, I just created this Google sheet file. Um, there's a lot of ways for people to do it. There is for me, it was kind of like, because I was in a relationship and we were splitting all these different expenses that it made more sense to do it this way, because we'd be like paying for groceries and then the other person's Venmoing that person. And then, uh, you know, we're splitting different things. It's, it, it just became like a mess with trying to track different things or using an app like, like mint or something to, to automate it, which I think can be useful. So I think this just helped everything to get in one place. And it was what worked for me. Again, what works for me doesn't have to work for everybody, but I still like to make the video and then put the, the budgeting template out there in case anybody wants to use it. And it's gotten, you know, some clicks not charging anything for it. Cause I think it's just, it's something anybody can make. It's nothing really like advanced. Um, so for me, that was what worked because I could like enter in, okay, I, I paid a hundred dollars for groceries and, uh, my fiance owes me, you know, 40 or $30 of that cause she eats less than me. So it, it, it'll adjust for that in that, in that Google sheet file. So it just, it made everything simpler. Um, because anytime I tried to track anything with an automated system, it wasn't really like tracking the right way. Um, but for some people that might work. I think that when you use, when you use an app or anything that automates budgeting though, it does give you uh, a little bit less oversight where you could miss a transaction. You're, you're not able to see exactly where everything is. So I think there's, you know, 
I think I think what works, what a good strategy would be is to use something like I'm doing just for a couple of months, like I said, to kind of audit yourself to see where your money's going, but then maybe switch to something more automated or something closer to whatever uh, whatever budgeting, budgeting style you go with. Yeah, no, no, I think within one of the apps, it's probably not gonna let you adjust your grocery spending based on the portion size between you and your girlfriend. So, mm-hmm. um, but but yeah. yeah, so I used YNAB for a little while and, and I think it's it's helpful to just you know, have to know where all of your spending is going and to say, hey, I spend this amount going out to get coffee, I spend this amount at restaurants, this amount here, and then to, to know kind of in buckets and then kind of what you were saying earlier of it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you do forever, but once you kind of have a, a grasp of that and to be like, hey, there's maybe a few areas that I could cut and then kind of decide here's how much I'm gonna save, here's how much I'm gonna invest, and then just kind of look at the overall balance at the end of the month of your bank accounts to say, you mm-hmm. know, am I directionally right so it's like, is my checking account going up a little bit because I'm hitting my savings goals, I'm hitting my investing goals, and I kind of am spending my money how, you know, how I'd like to. But then obviously if you have a month where you see like your checking account balance drop by a lot, then you're like, all right, well, what went wrong? And you can review that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, um, as intense, I say, or, or gone over quite as much as maybe you've chosen to, to do, but obviously yeah. you have a really good handle on, on your finances. Oh yeah, no, and it's and it, what I do, I'll I'll be the first to admit it's it's overkill. Like it's it's I just go through all my all my transactions, and I'm able to do that right now because it is just me and my and my fiance does her own thing as well. But once we combine things, once you know we have a family one day, like that's I know it's going to get more complicated. I know there's going to be more transactions, and I know I can only do this for so long. So um, it's something that works for me right now. But at the same time, I'm also trying to make certain things automated. So I do automatically invest into index funds and, and that type of thing. So it's like, I already have that money coming out of my checking account every single month. So when that's taken care of, it also kind of forces me to live off of less every month. Like it's, it's when you invest in yourself first, then you're, you're, you're just gonna have to live off of the rest. Um, but then, like you said, you, you check your checking account at the end of the month. And if it's in a good place, um, you know, you're able to at least gauge where you are. Yeah. I think everybody should at least do kind of a test of, you know, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months of see where their spending is and, and even trying to pay cash for things. If you do it for a week of just take out money mm-hmm. and spend cash everywhere, it's amazing just how you realize how quickly kind of money just disappears from your wallet versus just putting on a card and, and it's harder to kind of do the math sometimes. Yeah, I, I did that for, I put that to the test for a month. I used cash for a month. And um, so I, I shut up, I uh, put all my credit cards, shut them away in a drawer. And then I um, uh, I just took out cash from the ATM and I started to use it for every single thing. And I would track it the same way I would it with my budget. But what I ended up with is just a big pile of receipts at the end of every single week. And then it was just like this, this stack of paper. Um, it was incredibly hard to like track every transaction. And I had to go and like, almost do it like that day or I'd forget about it just because the credit cards do help to like simplify everything and put it in one place in one, one statement. Um, yeah. And I think I missed out on like, you know, I don't know, maybe like a hundred dollars worth of, of points and cash back and all that stuff from some of my spending. Yeah. I think it's just a good exercise. You've mentioned this a few times and and I'm kind of curious about it. And this is something that I think causes a lot of conflict in relationships is everything with relationships and money. And so maybe if we talk a little bit about, you know, first, how you think about, you know, just meeting someone and dating and how you talk about money, split bills, and then obviously you're engaged now. And so as you're in a more serious relationship, how do you think about, uh, how do you think about, you know, splitting money, talking about money, sharing all that information with your significant Mm -hmm. other? Yeah, it's, it's a big part. And again, it goes back to like, a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about it. Um, so it's something that when you meet somebody that's completely new to you, um, you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. Like they could have this entire, like their life has been shaped by whatever, whatever, like they grew up with, whatever their parents taught them about, about money, whatever their experiences are with money, it's, it's going to be completely different from you. So I think I kind of lucked out in, in that Jackie, my fiance, like when I met her, we, we were similar enough where like, she didn't like to like waste her money on useless things. She just, she likes to be very purposeful with her spending. Um, and she's, she's very organized too. So she was actually like, she was on board with the whole budgeting type of things, which was cool to see. Um, and she, like I said, she uses it the same template that I use and we just kind of go through it, you know, at least every other weekend, um, we'll sit down and we'll just do that and just, you know, talk about that kind of thing. 
Uh, and we've talked about it as, as things got more serious, you know, what we would do. And, um, you know, we're both very fortunate that like, we really don't have like debt right now. I have, I have a, a car payment, uh, that I'm, and I have a, and that's, that's about it. Like it's, we were very fortunate in a lot of areas. And so we recognize that that's like very unique for us to like come into a relationship like that. And we want to make sure we're, we're setting ourselves up, um, in the best way possible. So, uh, we both invest in, you know, Roth IRAs. We have our, uh, I had a 401k and I still have money in that 401k rolled over to an IRA now. Um, she has our 401k, we have all that type of stuff. So we're, we're taking care of, of all the investments that we should be making. And then we want to eventually, uh, buy a house together as well. So that'll be another big investment together, but we were kind of waiting and we're still waiting for the right opportunity there. But, um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to have the conversations about money because you really don't know how it's, how it's going to play out. Um, but yeah, she, she definitely appreciates that. Um, I'm somebody that takes an interest in this kind of thing and, um, it worked out well in terms of like the whole engagement thing where I was saving up cash because I knew that I wanted to eventually buy, uh, this ring to propose to somebody. Like I, I was always saving up for stuff. And eventually, like once I realized it was going to be her, um, you know, made sure I had that money set aside and decided to use a credit card and just paid that off in full. So I at least got some points for the honeymoon and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how money and relationships work. Have you talked about, for example, like, are you going to just have like one joint checking account? Are you like some stuff joint, some stuff separate, or, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to, to manage that as a, as a couple Have you, mm -hmm. have you kind of thought about what the, what the best way, or at least the, the first try at, at the best way is going to be? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be like, we're going to combine things for the most part. Like I'll still have separate business accounts. Um, we'll still have our own, like, I'm sure we'll have our own, like she, if she wants to have like a shopping type of account or like something where she can go spend money on her own, all money, uh, an account where I can spend money on my own. That's totally fine. But I think it, it'll probably make sense just to combine everything. And that's what we've talked about is, is just combining stuff. Um, that way we can manage this together. It's, it's, you know, it's a partnership. It's, it's, um, a financial partnership at the end of the day. So we're able to save for ourselves and save for a future family. Um, and set ourselves up for success. Uh, and, and again, create as little stress as possible because money can be stressful. Um, but we don't really disagree on a lot when it comes to, to finances. No, I think that's great. And then, so obviously a really big expense that you've kind of hinted at is getting engaged, a wedding just in general. How do you think about planning for that? How soon should someone start planning for that? That do they need to ha like, as you said, you're like putting money away before you knew it was going to be for actually getting her a ring, just knowing that, mm -hmm. Hey, this is a big expense. You know, I should start setting money aside. And then obviously right now you're in the, in the middle of planning your wedding. So how do you think about all that related to the money? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so like the conventional wisdom is like, okay, you should set aside three to six months worth of cash in a savings account as an emergency fund, which is great advice. And that'll help hold you over. But then at the same time, you might want to also have a separate fund that you're putting money aside for, for these um, special one time life events. Um, so engage, getting engaged, getting married. Um, they're two very big expenses that people can have in their lives, especially you know, somebody in their twenties, thirties, like it's a very common time to have this happening. So, but it's not something that you think about right away. So you, you graduate from college. I wasn't thinking about it. I was just trying to set, I was setting aside cash, not knowing what it might be for, you know? So I would have my emergency fund that I was able to get in place, but then I had other savings that I'm putting just, you know, in a high yield account. And a lot of people will say, okay, well, you know, that extra cash is kind of getting its purchasing power is, is going down with inflation over time. But I think that's only something to worry about over the long run. Like if you're keeping your cash set aside in a savings account and you're just going to do that for 30, 40 years, yeah, inflation is going to eat away at that. And it's not a smart thing to do. But if it's just for something that's maybe in a, you know, a five year horizon, then okay, it's all right to set aside some cash as long as you're setting aside other cash. That's, you know, that the sole purpose of that money is to invest. Um, but for this, I'm just setting it aside for my emergency fund. And then I'm setting aside in a separate account just for whatever it might be. You know, it, it was hopefully going to go towards an engagement ring, but if, if the opportunity came and luckily it did, um, yeah. So the, the engagement, engagement ring was one thing. Um, it's, you know, I, I went with a lab diamond cause it's cheaper. Um, I went with something that was, I, I think, I think when I read online, like if you go for something that's like 
one carat versus like just under one carat or two two carats versus just under two carats, it's like the price point can be a lot cheaper. So there's like, there's different little things to work around with buying an engagement ring that fits within your price point. Um, I told her I won't say exactly what the price was because I don't want her to, uh, I don't want her to know. She doesn't want it. She doesn't want to know. So I won't say what the actual number was here, but um but it was it was it was something that you know I, I saved up for, um, and I'm glad that I did, and I was able to buy it just completely outright, like I said, with a credit card, but then paid off the credit card, so didn't pay any interest. I could have financed it if I wanted to, but that wasn't what I was trying to do. I, I just even at zero percent, I don't like to take on additional debt just for for that kind of an expense. Um, I was totally fine paying in cash for it just to own it outright and then um, give it to her, and that was one of the happiest days of our lives. So we really. You know, it, it was a it was an expense that was kind of in the works for a long time, but I'm I'm really happy that I was able to afford it and uh, and make that purchase. But then, um, for a wedding itself is is a whole other story. I mean, it all depends on what you want to do. You can go low budget wedding. You can do a small event. You can just go get married at the courthouse, and a lot of people do that. And um, it's it's really just up to the couple at that point, like what you want to do. Do you want it to be an event? Um, so for us, it's 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 more of a more of an event that's like very family oriented. Like our, our families both want to be able to have this, this thing that brings together her side of the family, my side of the family. And I have this, I have this huge extended family. Like my dad's one of seven, my mom's one of three and she's got a ton of cousins as well. So like, it'll be a ton of people. Um, but our parents, luckily they, they wanted to be able to contribute to make that happen. So we have money that we're contributing. They have money that they're chipping in. Um, but it's because that's what we decided we wanted to do at the end of the day. So if, if it was something that we wanted to just keep it low cost and keep it between us. That's the option that we have. But, you know, we set aside some extra savings that we're going to put towards that as well. Yeah, I think that can probably get tough sometimes because it's not just the the ring is something that is just kind of your decision. Obviously, you don't have to disclose the amount anywhere to your fiance or anything else. But then all of a sudden you're like, yeah. you know, what do, what do my parents want? What do her parents want? What does she want? What do I want? And then how to kind of organize everybody's finances in a way that that matches with with kind of all those desires at the same time. So I, I can imagine, obviously you were in a good situation with that, but for sometimes it can be just this huge kind of burden to make everybody's parents or somebody happy when maybe the the finances don't match up with what everybody would like to do in terms of the wedding. Yeah, it's, I mean, like I said, we're in, incredibly fortunate that like our families even want to do that. And if our if our families did not want to do that, like we would, we would work within our own budget to have a smaller ceremony where it would just be our, our parents there, my siblings, like that kind of thing. So it's, it's really all up to the, to the couple. Um, but I don't suggest like ever going into debt just to find like weddings. It's, it's unbelievable as we've toured these places, as we've like started talking to vendors. Um, it's just unbelievable. Like how expensive the wedding industry is. Like I want to get into that type of business <laughs> later on in life. Cause it is just, it's marked up so much. These places are just making a killing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where the real inflation numbers are. Is is the cost of weddings? <laughs> it could be. It could be. Um, one of the things you mentioned yeah. related to the to the engagement ring of paying for it on a credit card. A lot of your YouTube content is related to credit cards. Why do you think that credit cards are such an important tool? Or I guess they could potentially cause lots of financial problems as well. But why are they so important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. It's something that it's really, again, up to the person. And it, it's tough for somebody to be like, it's tough for somebody to be really, um, really like critical of themselves and say, okay, I should not use credit cards or I should use credit cards. Like you have to really dig deep and try to understand what your spending habits are like, which again, goes back to the whole budgeting thing, just to get, do an audit of your, sp audit of your spending to understand like, do you overspend? Are you likely to overspend on a credit card? Are you likely to carry debt? Um, so with credit cards, there's a lot of like education that goes into it. You have to like, you have to put in the work just to understand what a credit card is, how you pay a credit card, why it's important. And if you don't put in just, it doesn't take much effort, but you have to just put in a little bit of research and hopefully my videos and your videos, anybody's videos on YouTube can help with that type of thing. Um, but for me, credit cards are important for a few reasons. Uh, number one, they help to build your credit. So. Uh, when I was just using a debit card for every single purchase in college, that wasn't doing anything for me. Um, first of all, I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't getting anything back in terms of cash back or whatever, but I wasn't building credit either. So, um, fortunately my mom did suggest I get a credit card my junior year in college. So I was able to put like groceries and some textbook expenses on that, um, just to have like a few, um, transactions and to be able to like report a small balance. 
um, not carry the balance, never pay any interest, but to be able to at least like make on-time payments, keep a low credit utilization and show um, the credit bureaus that I'm responsible enough to handle um, this type of small amount of credit that I've been given, build up my credit score a little bit so that by the time I graduated college, I had two years of payment history on that card and then I was able to get into the other credit cards. So um, building credit score is important, obviously, um, when it comes time to buy a house later on in life, whenever that might be, when it comes time to um, buy a car, potentially, if you're not buying in cash. So I, I bought a car, um, my, my old car actually got totaled in a flood uh, the other year. So I had to buy uh, a, a new one. It was, it was a used car, it was a 2018, but um, I, I was able to good, get a good interest rate on that just because I had a good credit score. Um, I'll be able to get a good rate on a mortgage one day and having a lower interest rate on any type of loan is going to save you tens of thousands of dollars. So that's why the credit score is important. Um, it's important for you know going to rent an apartment uh, you know, the landlord's going to want to see that you're responsible and able to make on-time payments with the rent payments. So if you have a low credit score and, or no credit score, I've heard some people having to put down several months worth of cash as a deposit, just to be able to move into the apartment, to make the land landlord feel at ease that you're going to be able to make rent payments. Um, so that's one of the big things. Uh, and then the second thing was really, I wanted to be able to travel. So, so I wanted to be able to do more of that. And I, you know, heard credit card points, you see some stories on the news and stuff. Uh, so I started to try to do a little bit of research after I graduated school and kind of came across the whole world of, uh, the chase trifecta, the American express, all these points and what you can do. So I decided I would give it a try and just, you know, I understood how to use a credit card at that point, which was important. And then, um, was starting to get those type, types of cards, the chase cards, um, that I talk a lot about on my channel, uh, eventually got into American Express and was just starting to accumulate these points and was able to then start traveling a little bit. And it, it was just so cool to me that I could have an entire trip covered on points where if I just use a debit card to pay for something, I wasn't earning anything, but if I just used a credit card and then treated that credit card like a debit card and paid it off in full, but then took the points that I earned from that, took the welcome bonuses that I earned from that, saved it up and can go travel basically for free. I mean, there's still small expenses you gotta pay with that, but like it's almost for free. Um, and then when you learn how to do it the right way, which is what I focus on over the past few years and with this YouTube channel, you could take those points and actually kind of travel in style too. You could fly business in first class and um, you, you can go and stay at these cool resorts um, all on the points. So. It was those two things were the big things, the credit score and the travel that got me interested in credit cards. So I just started to make videos about it on YouTube. And um, I think a lot of people are starting to realize, you know, when you use credit cards the right way, there's a lot of power in them. Yeah, no, I think that totally makes sense. One quick note, if there's any college students listening to this, just a quick story. What he was mentioning of getting a credit card as a junior is really important because credit card companies and banks will essentially give credit cards away like candy to college students. But if you wait till you're done with college, like a good friend of mine was making over $100,000 a year and had to get a secured credit card. So he had to put a deposit down to get a credit card because he was say 23 and had never built up his credit prior to getting a job. So if you're a student and you can get one with a small limit, pay for your Netflix every month on it and have it automatically paid off and just have that for you know a handful of months or a couple of years is gonna really help when you get out in the real world and need to get an apartment, wanna get a car loan, mortgage, or any of those other things of like, just start and start kind of the right way. And that kind of segues into my next question on what are some really common mistakes? Obviously you've created videos on this, you've talked to people and maybe made some mistakes around credit cards, but what do you see as some of the largest credit card mistakes? Yeah, I mean, you don't ever wanna ruin your credit score when you're using credit cards. And it's, it's easy to do that if you don't understand how to use them. So uh, the top two factors going into your credit score is going to be payment history, and then credit utilization. Th those two make up almost two thirds of your score. Um, but even just like one slip up with a missed payment, it could hurt your score for the next, I think, seven plus years. So um, you wanna make sure that you, when you're using a credit card, you never miss a payment. You wanna always pay, on, pay in full, of course, cause you don't wanna carry a balance and pay interest, but um, you need to know, okay, what is my credit card statement opening date? What's the closing date? And then what's the due date, which is usually about three weeks after your statement closes. So you need to make sure that um, between that statement opening date and the statement closing date, 
if you're going to make any purchases on that credit card, you want to make sure that uh, the total balance that you accumulate during that period is a very small percentage of your total credit limit. So, you know, if you have just to keep things simple, a thousand dollar credit limit, you want to probably keep that down to maybe like, I don't know, $30 or something like that, like just some, something very low. Um, and you can you can pay off the credit card uh, partially uh, just to keep that balance low. So your credit utilization stays somewhere below 5%. I like to keep my credit utilization really in like the low single digits um, as a percentage of my total credit limit. Um, so keep credit utilization low from that statement closing date, or statement opening date to the statement closing date. Then after the statement closes, um, whatever your, your, your balance is on that date is going to get reported to the credit bureaus and that's when your credit utilization gets reported as well. So that's going to affect your credit score depending on whatever it is at that date. There's been times where, um, if I made a larger purchase, like when I bought that engagement ring, I actually didn't pay it off, uh, in full until after the statement closed, but I made sure my limit was high enough so that it didn't like impact it too much. But my, uh, my, my credit utilization was actually a little bit higher than it normally would be. And I saw my score drop a few points just because of that. Yeah. All I had to do was just pay it off in full. And then the next billing cycle, it, it went right back up and it was fine. Um, but that's just an example of like what could happen. Yeah, so, I've seen just really, um, just really anyway. quick on that. I've seen my credit score change a lot. I think what they say generally is to be below 30%. And then I think there's another cutoff mm -hmm. at, at like 20 or 10% where if you're under 30, Hey, that's good. If you're under 20 or 10, you're going to see your score jump up even more. And it's not just your Mm -hmm. your overall utilization on all of your credit cards and debt added up, but it's going to look at on an individual basis. So the one card you put the engagement ring on, if, if you used 90% of the utilization on that one card, but overall you have plenty of other available credit, you would be dinged a lot based on just that one card being overutilized essentially. Yeah, exactly. So you want to make sure you're aware of your utilization, um, combined across any credit cards you have as well as per card. So, um, that's important for your statement billing cycle right there. Then after your statement closes on the closing date, you're gonna have, like I said, about three weeks. You want to make sure you just, just check with your credit card issuer, make sure you understand when your due date is, but typically it's after it's three weeks after that statement closing date around that time. Um, that's when you have to make sure you pay off your credit card ideally in full, but at the very least you need to make the minimum payment again, pay it off in full, but the minimum payment at the very least, that'll count as an on-time payment. If you do that by the due date. Um, and then just by making that on-time payment, that works very well for your credit score. If you miss that payment, that could drop your score significantly, like dozens and dozens of points. Um, and the longer that score is late, the more it's going to hurt your, so if it's 30 days late, that's one thing. If it's 60 days late, that's worse. 90 days late, late, even worse. And eventually if it's too late, the credit card company is just going to sell off that debt to a collections agency. And that, that looks awful for your credit report. And that's going to destroy it, take a lot of time to recover from. So that's why it's like when people say, you know, you're going to get into credit cards. Um, another common mistake that I see people do is they apply for so many at once. And what people say is, okay, you can help out your credit age. So like I opened that one student credit card and that's now my oldest account. And it's, I think almost six, seven years old. Um, if I had opened up maybe like two or three cards within those first few months of getting credit cards, and then I had them all aging at the same time, then I have a better credit age, which is another factor of your credit score. But at the same time, I think you should really focus a lot of your energy on learning the whole credit card world in the first place. So maybe it could be good for your credit age if you open up several cards at once. But I think I think you really are forgetting about the education aspect of credit cards, too. So I say just open up in that first year, really probably one card in the first, you know, hold that first card for maybe six months or so. Then in months six to 12, you can try to open up another one if you want to, whether that's another student card or a secured credit card, or maybe at that time you'll be able to qualify for an unsecured card with a, a smaller credit limit. Um, but really in that first year, just, just focus on learning the credit card game. Don't worry too much about all the benefits, the cash back, the points or anything like that. It's just about education and learning because, um, you know, when you have total credit card debt, that's almost a trillion dollars here in the U S like, it's just, that's, that's a dangerous thing. So you don't want to become a part of that statistic. So, um, be very careful. I'd, I'd say those are really the most common mistakes that I see people making. Um, yeah. as, as far as credit yeah, cards. No, one really quick thing on, on being late. So if you're less than 30 days, it's not going to ding your credit score, but usually if you're even a day late, you're going to have probably a $35 late fee. So the late fee is a lot. And then, so, I mean, what I would, what I always say is just, if you, for whatever reason, well, if you can just set up auto pay to pay the entire balance, but then kind of worst case scenario, at least make sure that, you know, on auto pay, the minimum to being, being made. So you like, don't have to think about it 
and the minimum payment goes through and and at that way at least your credit score is not not being dinged from from that and i completely agree on the you know as what we talked about in other things too of of take your time with stuff and think long term you don't necessarily have to like hey let's open up three credit cards right now and then you know obviously one of them you forget to set up auto pay on and then you know just don't pay it for a little while and so obviously kind of take your time and don't be in a huge rush with that. And then that kind of moves on to, to kind of my next question of how do you recommend someone get started and progress with credit cards? So you said, you know, get your first student card maybe, or a secured card, wait a few months. And then how do, how do you think about going from that to say the, the Chase Trifecta or the Amex Platinum or mm -hmm. some of the other cards? Like, how do you think of that progression? Yeah. So, I mean, I think of the Chase Trifecta as like the perfect stepping stone kind of like the perfect path into the uh, the whole credit card world just because with chase first of all there's the whole chase 524 rule which is i mean i guess i could briefly talk about it like where you can if if you uh if you've been approved for five or more personal credit cards across any issuer within the past 24 months chase is automatically going to deny you for uh, a credit card if you're over that rule so um you just want to make sure that if you are interested in credit cards and I think it makes a lot of sense to go for Chase cards first because you're going to be under that rule when you're just getting started. So if you say, say you did what I said where you got the student credit card or a secured credit card or even like a credit builder type of card um, in that first year, um, you know, you would, hold, you would have that. You would learn how the credit card works, make some on-time payments. You'd probably start to build your credit score a little bit, um, build up that history of, of on-time payments and have good utilization. Um, and then you could look to get into the whole world of Chase cards. So if you're still a student, you could look at the Chase student uh, freedom card uh, is a good one with no annual fee. Um, otherwise, you could what I did was so I had that Wells Fargo card um, for about two years as my only credit card. But then I opened up um, the Chase Freedom, which is now the Chase Freedom Flex. But that's a no annual fee card. Um, but what that does is it gives you an option to um, either go down the path of travel, which is what I did, or you can go down the path of cash back. So Chase is cool because it gives you um, good value for the points. All their, all their cards, the Freedom Flex, the Freedom Unlimited, Sapphire Preferred, Sapphire Reserve, they all earn Chase Ultimate Rewards points. Um, and those points can be converted either to travel rewards for more value if you have one of those Sapphire cards, or it can be converted to cash back at a rate of one cent per point, which is a good flat rate for cash back just kind of across the credit card industry. And just for reference, if you went with American Express cards that earn points, their cash back rate is 0 0.6 cents per point. So 60% of the value converting Amex points to cash back compared to Chase. So um, I think if you're, so really with Amex points, the only way it makes sense to get those and have those cards is if you're going to redeem those points for travel. Otherwise it makes sense to just get a straight up cash back card instead. Um, so Chase points at least gives you that option where you can then start to explore that. Um, so I think going into the Chase trifecta, you get the Freedom Flex and Freedom Unlimited somewhere in that year two range. Um, and then you're able to start seeing, okay, this is how the Chase system works. You save up all those points because eventually you can get the Sapphire preferred at $95 per year. Um, a lot of people don't want to pay an annual fee, but for me, I think it's very much worth it because you're going to get a very good sign up bonus on the Sapphire preferred. Usually it's at least 60,000 points after $4,000 of spend in the first three months. So if you can hit that sign up bonus spend, if you, you know, you're spending and you can hit that, then it's good. Um, but then you're able to have these three chase cards in the chase trifecta combined. They all cost only $95 per year, but the Sapphire preferred has the ability to take your chase points. You get at least 25% more value. So 1.25 cents per point. If you take those chase points and redeem them for travel in the chase travel portal for flights or hotels or car rentals, even, um, but you can do that, or you can learn uh, what I talk about on my channel, where you can transfer points out to some of the partner programs. Um, and just as an example, Hyatt is, it's kind of by far my favorite to use when it comes to Chase points, because it's, Amex does not transfer to Hyatt, but Chase does. And Hyatt is one of the few hotel programs that has not really devalued their, their, their points currencies. Um, so I've been able to stay at, I mean, resorts, like I went to Puerto Rico last year, um, for five days, four nights, and it was this awesome resort. Um, and I think the cash value of the total stay would have been like $35,000, but it only cost maybe 80,000 chase points. Um, which if you do the math, 80,000 chase points, if I just cashed it out at one cent per point, that's $800. So I really used $800 worth of points to book a $35,000 or $3,500, um, hotel stay. So that's pretty good value as far as I'm concerned. Um, 
So that's that's the way I would do the Chase trifecta. And then if you decide that the $95 Sapphire Preferred is not worth it for you anymore, what you can do is you can actually downgrade it to a Chase Freedom Flex or Chase Freedom Unlimited. Um, and you can actually have more than one of those cards if you do end up doing that. That's that's kind of a little like tip. Uh, but so basically there's, there's zero risk if the Sapphire Preferred is not worth it for you. You're not locked into paying $95 per year. You can always downgrade it to a no annual fee card, keep the same account open, which is good for your credit score. Um, and then you're just left with these like no annual fee cards that you can go and, and earn cash back on and then go more of the cash back route. But I think the Chase Drive Factor is a good starting point when you're deciding whether you want to go cash back or travel. Travel, you're going to get more value. You just have to do a little bit more work um, and, and research and learn how, how it works with the transfer partners. But it's worth it if you can figure it out. Um, and then the cash back route is just simple and straightforward. So if you really just want to like hands off approach with credit cards, then that's the way to go. I think that makes total sense. I think the chase cards give you flexibility for either cash back or points for the same cards versus with Amex, they have some good cash back cards like the, the blue cash preferred, but it's only that, and you don't get the travel rewards for it. And so it's kind of an either or with Amex and then with chase, I think gives you more flexibility. And obviously you don't have to, to get the value from, you know, all the different kind of. Um, different credits that you get only on a monthly basis and things like that and have a and the, have the high annual fees for the the gold and platinum card with Amex. So totally agree on that point. Yeah. Yeah. And there, for some of those cashback cards with Amex too, which are, um, they're not earning the points, but something like the blue cash every day, no annual fee. I think it's 3% on grocery stores, gas stations, online shopping now. Like that's a good card because it's, it's, it's less commitment to get into it with zero annual fee. And then you're just, you're earning straight up cash back. So there's, uh, a limited upside, but I mean, 3% is still a very solid rate to earn in those types of categories. So if you're looking to keep the annual fees down and you just want something reliable, then that's a good option to look to as well. But for me, when it comes to credit cards, I'm looking for outsized value and greater upside um, because I want to do the travel stuff, at least right now in my life. Maybe later on, maybe 10 years from now, I'm probably going to be like, okay, I'm going to just play it safe and maybe not need to travel or just, you know, when I, I might go towards the cashback setup at that point. But for right now, I like having that option to, um, to do those types of types of trips. Okay. And so for right now, what would you say your favorite credit cards are? Uh, favorite credit cards. I would have to say if I'm talking about like just for the average person, for anybody, I would go with the city custom cash and the chase freedom flex. So the freedom flex, both, they're both no annual fee cards. So again, low commitment, um, Freedom Flex gives you that access to start to get into the Chase Trifecta, but it's also good as a standalone cashback card where it gets 5% um, back in rotating quarterly categories, which is going to include a lot of like common categories like grocery stores, gas stations, Amazon. Right now in, in the fourth quarter here of 2022, it's uh, PayPal and Walmart. So around the holiday season, that's pretty useful. I've used that a bunch. Um, so you're getting 5% back in those rotating categories, but then you also get 3% back on dining, 3% back at um, drugstores, 1% uh, back on everything else, which isn't that great. But when you're looking at just something that like covers a lot of categories, that's pretty good for no annual fee. And then for the city custom cash, it's also a 5% back card, but it, it kind of, I say, ironically has more flexibility than the Freedom Flex, where it's 5% it's, uh, it's back in your highest eligible category across one of 10 categories. And it's just whatever your highest category is each monthly billing cycle. So you could just take this card and actually use it in only one of those 10 categories to basically lock in 5% back. Um, so if you want to use this as a grocery store card, you just use it only at grocery stores and you're going to lock in 5% back on grocery stores. It's only up to $500 of spending to get that cash back um, per quarter. Uh, but still, just, just with that alone, you're, you're really getting a lot of value from that type of card. Oh, perfect. Uh, you, you hit on this a little bit, but why don't you talk a little bit about some of your tips for getting the most out of your travel rewards point? So, you know, you kind of talked about the traveling with Hyatt or yeah, staying at Hyatt, um, using Amex for traveling to Europe, but, but in general, what tips do you have for getting the most out of the points that you built up from welcome bonuses and your spending? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's all going to come down to what you're looking to do. So I'll have people like people will comment on my videos and say, you should not redeem this for for uh, you know, a two cent per point valuation. Like you should be going for 10 cents per point or more on every single time. But like, if, if I'm somebody that doesn't wanna go fly internationally and I don't wanna like fly business class because maybe I just wanna get from point A to point B and I don't really care about the fancy flying stuff. Like to me, it's, 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 it's whatever you prefer to do. So that's why I like to use the chase points for Hyatt because I, I think if I'm able to get a good hotel redemption, 
I'd rather do that over a over a flight. That's just me personally because you you get to you know enjoy the hotel stay. If it's a nice resort like the Puerto Rico trip, that was that was kind of like the entire the entire stay was giving me value. Like it was it was twenty four almost twenty four seven. Like it was almost for an entire week. Um, 24 hours a day, you're getting value from those points. Whereas like a flight, you know, it's, it could be a seven hour, eight hour flight and then it's over. And you're probably going to not like being on a, um, a cramped airplane regardless of where you sit. So maybe it's not worth it, but sometimes it is like for, for, you know, a red eye flight, like, like when we're going to Paris, it's going to be worth it for us to have the lay flat seats in business class. So for me, that, that type of a redemption is going to be worth it where I got seven cents per point. And that brings me to the next, next thing here, which is, is looking at the cent per point value. So this is where it kind of gets tricky for people, and it's it, it lost me at first when I was getting into the whole credit card thing. So um, when I got my Chase trifecta and was starting to figure out how to redeem those points, I kind of just decided I was going to play it safe and just redeem um, in the Chase travel portal where I got that fixed 1.25 cents per point because you're still getting good value, um, but you're not getting as much value as you could if you like figured out how to transfer out to, like I said, Hyatt. Um, so that's the way I like to use Chase points is by like, uh, basically going to, as an example, um, if I was going to stay at a hotel somewhere, say I was traveling, um, I'm going down to Washington, I'm going down to Washington DC in a couple weeks. So I'm going to go, uh, I booked a Hyatt, but what I did was, um, I looked on Hyatt's website to see the date that I was looking to stay there. And then I looked at the cash price, whatever it was. Um, you're just going to take the cash price of that, of that stay. We'll just say it's for one night. Um, take the cash price then go to um, change the filters and then Hyatt search, change it to points or to show points and awards, see what the points price is. And all you gotta do is take the cash price, divide it by the points price, and that's gonna give you a number. That's the cent per point number. And you just have to compare that with, um, with the cent per points that I talked about before. So it's, it's one cent per point for chase points when you're talking about cash back. It's 1.25 cents per point in the travel portal, but so that's, that's our number to beat basically, if we're looking to book a hotel, because we could book that hotel in the travel portal at 1.25 cents per point, we're trying to see if by transferring points to Hyatt that we're able to get above 1.25 cents per, per point instead. Um, so in this example, let's just say I was able to find two cents per point was that value. If I took the cash price of the hotel, say divided by the points, if I transferred them, that'll give me the cent per point value. I could tell that it's a good deal based on comparing it to the travel portal. Um, so all I got to do is go into my chase account, link my Hyatt account. It's free to create an account with Hyatt, um, enter in your account and then transfer over those points. Just be aware that when you go to transfer your points, it's, it's a one way street. So you can't transfer them back. So you have to be, a, be sure that the, uh, the award is there that you're able to book with those points. Because once you transfer the points from chase to Hyatt, you can't transfer them back. So you're stuck with them in Hyatt. But if you're able to do that and you're able to figure out how it's done again, watch my videos, watch any other video out there, go read the points guy. Um, I personally love reading the points guy just cause he's that, that website is just great for like having examples and stuff like that. So, um, it's really good to use those resources to kind of like double check your math and double check the process. Um, just to make sure that you're getting a good deal. Perfect. Um, so one last thing I want to ask you about is we talked about this a little bit on just kind of your process of, you know, you talked about in your budgeting video of looking at your banking account, your bank account and seeing the balance go down. And I think that's a situation a lot of people find themselves in to now you're saving 60% of your income. What tips or recommendations do you have for someone to go from the, your previous situation to your current situation? It's, it, it's about what you prioritize. Um, so it's, it's easy to say, you know, cut down your expenses. Um, and you have to look for ways to cut. Like, is, there's no way around that to begin. It, it's, it's, I, I think people do, again, I, I come from a place that is very fortunate. So it's easy for me to say I was able to cut this and I was able to increase my income. It's, it's easy to say that because I was in a very fortunate situation, but no matter what, like there's, there's, there's no getting around it. There's no making excuses that you have to find ways to cut expenses in some way. So whether that is moving to a smaller apartment, moving to another location. So I know people will, will maybe like live in an apartment that's, um, closer to home, but maybe you have to move further away or maybe the opposite's true where like you, you have a job and you're commuting an hour, you know, to get to that job. I was doing that at first where like you're commuting an hour. That's a lot of extra money in, in gas costs, but not only that potential costs, uh, to repair and, and maintain your vehicle. Like there's a lot of extra cost involved in that type of commute. And a lot of people have those long commutes. So that's something you can maybe look to cut. But along with that, you also have that, that 
time cost that you're investing every day where you know you're commuting an hour there and back so it's two hours every day that is is doesn't necessarily have to go to waste like i said you can kind of learn at the same time you can listen to audiobooks and try to like try to increase you know just a different knowledge that you can apply elsewhere in life but um that's two hours that you could have to potentially like start a at-home side hustle or online business or whatever so there's there's a lot of opportunity cost in that time so i would first look at what you can cut from your budget in terms of saving money then i would look at what you can do in terms of your time investment where you can save time and how you can then invest that time back into yourself or back into some sort of venture a lot of people don't want to start something themselves which is totally fine because it is it's not for everybody like not everybody needs to start something so if you need to just pick up a second job you might have to do that or you might need to see if you can change companies a lot of times people talk about changing companies is you know you can boost your income a lot faster by making jumps you know maybe whether that's in the same industry or a different industry um obviously there's still risks in doing that you know maybe you 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 prefer one company over the other, or in my case, I, I took that risk and I, I made the company change, but it wasn't a good fit like I thought it would be. So there's risk in that. Um, so you could also try to, you know, talk to your employer if you're, if you're gonna stay at your current job, see if you could set like, like a six to 12 month plan right now where you say, okay, I'm gonna set these goals of X, Y, Z. If I can achieve these goals in the next six months or 12 months or whatever it is, can we have a conversation at the time and sit back down and discuss my compensation they're going to appreciate the initiative that you're taking to go and increase your value to the company. And then if you're able to meet those targets, they have no reason not to offer you a, a higher salary. And if you, uh, if you're, if they don't offer you a higher salary after that time, you can put that on your resume and say, I achieved X, Y, Z, and then look elsewhere. So there's just a lot of things to do, but it's really all about taking action today. And, and then thinking long-term again, common theme here, thinking long-term, putting actions into place. Um, and then I would say, really focus on increasing your income because of that. that that's, that's the key thing with going from a 0% savings rate like I did to 60% of my paycheck of my monthly income this past month is, is I mean, 75% of that is, is due to me increasing my income or just trying to increase my income. Maybe it won't happen right away. I got lucky and I was able to do it with this YouTube channel, but this is also not guaranteed. Like this could all go away tomorrow and then I'm gonna have to figure something else out. So by no means is this like, bragging in any way like i just this is just what's worked for me so far and you know hopefully i can keep practicing some of these things that i'm talking about and um creating that gap in my budget because it's it's the only way to like get ahead and have that extra money to invest um into into building your future wealth yeah no that that's phenomenal so thanks for taking the time today for people that want to learn more about personal finance credit cards budgeting with google sheets anything else what's the best way to to stay in touch with you <laughs> Uh, you can go ahead and look me up on uh, look me up on YouTube. Uh, just search Daniel Braun. It should come right up. You could search um, search Amex Platinum, search Amex Gold. It'll probably pop up there too. Um, and then uh, yeah, go follow me there. I have an Instagram as well. It's just um, it's at underscore Dan Braun. Uh, that was the only handle that was available, so I took that. Uh, yeah, go ahead and follow me there. That's not as much finance stuff, but you could follow what's going on in my life, and I'll post stories if you know I'm ever. Uh, booking something cool and, and trying to give some travel tips. Uh, hopefully, you know, post a little bit there next year. But yeah, definitely go follow me on YouTube and, and check me out. Leave a comment, subscribe. Perfect. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching today's episode. If you want to see some of Dan's content, you can find his channel up above right here. And if you want to see the next interview in our series, check out the video below. Hope to see you in future videos.